Welcome to part three of the Tao of Digital, an introduction to the fundamentals of modern photo imaging. I'm Lee Veris here again with the third chapter of our examination of important digital imaging concepts. In this installment, we finally come to the question of which color space we should use for our photography. This is one area where there is tremendous, almost religious, fanatical conflict between two camps. On one side, we have the majority of Photoshop pundits who advocate a large gamut, high bit depth workflow utilizing the largest usable color space that just so happens to have the word pro in it. And on the other side, we have the conservative, some may say old fashioned camp advocating sRGB or something, sometimes uh, Adobe RGB as a sensible workspace that we can actually see and therefore judge the colors on our monitor. Before we get into the nitty gritty of the debate, let's examine what it is that makes a workspace. There are basically two philosophies for color spaces, output oriented and scene oriented. Scene oriented says we should work in a color space that encodes the largest possible color volume so we don't miss out on possible real world colors. Output oriented says we should work in the smallest color space that encodes usable colors most efficiently and not waste encoding non-visible colors that we can't see to edit. So the basic orientation choice all involves either the desire to work with all possible colors or limit oneself to usable visible colors. Another argument comes into play with the idea that one can future-proof one's work by using the largest possible workspace now under the assumption that when printing output technology advances, we can take advantage of increased color gamut without having to re-edit our files. First, I'd like to start by examining the importance of color in photographic images to establish its concept text in, excuse the pun, the big picture. It's important to realize that digital cameras only record, record brightness values for the red, green, and blue filtered pixels representing the image. Color is interpreted from these brightness values, interpolating the missing data from neighboring pixels. This requires a fair amount of complex calculation known as a demosaicing algorithm. And that happens in a separate stage from the actual image capture. Also, color judgment is highly subjective and prone to distortion from memory effects and other vagaries of the human visual system. Luminosity is less ambiguous as it is a simpler measurement and as it turns out luminosity is much more important for the recognition of features in a photographic image. Let me show it what I mean here. While this is not the best picture in the world, this image is very information rich. We can identify a lot of different details, number of people, where they are located in the scene, and what they are doing, as well as a number of other items of interest in the scene. Now if I drain all the brightness values out of the scene and leave only color with one uniform brightness, what do we have? Well, I would submit that we no longer have a photograph. In fact, if you had not seen the previous image, you would have a lot of difficulty determining what this is a picture of. But if I take the color away and leave all the brightness values, we end up with a black and white photo. It is very clear what's going on. We have no difficulty identifying most features in the image. And we have a photograph here. When we add the color, we have an additional level of information to be sure. But whether the color is warmer or cooler or more saturated or less saturated doesn't have as much impact on the overall image as the range of light and dark values. Keep this in mind while we consider the use of super wide color gamut spaces like Profoto RGB. All right, so just what is color gamut? Well, first, the whole idea of a color space is that of a complete range of colors represented in a three dimensional space. The volume of this space is the color gamut as encoded in 3D. A large gamut color space like Profoto is capable of representing a wider range of colors than a smaller gamut color space like sRGB. Okay, pretty straightforward. 
So let's let's look at some 3D color spaces. Okay, so what we have here, this is sRGB. This is a I've got a wireframe here indicating the shape. Most of the time we look at these things, we, we are looking at the uh, kind of a flat 2D representation, which is outline, sort of like the projected outline on the floor here represents. But it doesn't give you a really complete picture of, of uh, the shape of the space. So what we have here is uh, we have vertical axis is the L, sort of L channel of our, our uh, LAB. That would be the lightness to darkness. So we have the white point up here, the black point down here. And on the the uh, the B channel here, we have yellow to blue, and the A channel. Let me get this around so you can read it properly. Here's the A channel. We have magenta to green. Uh, so the shape is kind of odd. It's it's always sort of a a, a lumpy kind of a shape here. Uh, with sort of projections out into the very vivid uh, the red, the, the blue, and the green. Okay, so this is the size of sRGB. Now let's, let's uh, I'm going to make this kind of a, a flat uh, shading here for, for sRGB. And uh, let's look at, uh, let's look at Adobe RGB. So Adobe RGB, I made it, made it a wireframe. You can see Adobe RGB is just a little bit bigger. Um, it's and it, as we rotate this around, you can see it has the greatest additional volume of color in the the greens, uh, sort of the from the cyans to the greens. It really got a big extra volume of color here. So S, uh, Adobe RGB is is better. Uh, it has more ranges of greens and. Uh, a little bit more reds, pretty close in the blues. The blues and cyans here are very fairly close. It's not that much bigger. And basically, it maps to the same white point. Now, one thing I want to point out here, because you'll see in a minute why that's important, um, the white point is offset a little bit. This is just sort of a mathematical issue here. Uh, white is still white, but in the, in the way the, sh the space is shaped, it's, see it's a little offset from the actual uh, white of the L, uh, the L channel here in LAB. So this white point is just offset a little bit. Um, okay, so let's let's turn off Adobe RGB and now compare this with Profoto. So here's Profoto, quite a bit bigger, huge amount of extra colors in the red spectrum. In fact, these colors over here at the edge of Profoto are basically invisible to humans, uh, but it encodes those anyway. Um, you know, a little bit more blue, but basically not, not significant. You know, there's a little bit of bump in the blue there, but it's really not that great. And, and you can see the offset here in, in sRGB pokes some of this, uh, some of the sRGB color spaces. It's, it's, you know, technically it's just outside of a pro photo, but that has more to do with the offset. In the in the white point, so the pro photo lines up perfectly with the L uh, of uh, LAB. It's more of an encoding thing. I wouldn't attach too much significance to these colors that are poking outside of uh, uh, pro photo here. Uh, although technically they may be just outside of pro photo, I don't think that, it, that it's it's a significant uh, kind of difference. But you can see quite a bit more in the greens, uh, this sort of bigger volume, the blue greens out here, and especially in the reds, we've got a lot of extra uh, possible colors that are encoded in Profoto. Okay, so that's all well and good. There's no dis there's no dispute about you know Profoto being a much bigger color space. But uh, another thing I can do here is show you real-world images and how they map out in these color spaces. So I'm going to return now just to looking at uh, sRGB and we'll make that uh, make that a wireframe here. And uh, we're going to load in uh, some images. Okay, so 
I'm going to look at this image. Besides looking at these color spaces in sort of an abstract way, we're going to also examine the actual color mapping of individual images. So we're going to look at this particular image. And I have a friend who happens to be a very famous fashion photographer. He always works in 16-bit Pro Photo RGB. And he claims that he can see a difference in his beauty and fashion work, especially in skin tones. So let's check it out. We're going to, we're going to see how the colors of this image map to uh, the different workspaces. Okay, so let's uh, let's load the the portrait. Here's the sRGB portrait. The way it maps out. Uh, okay, so you know, kind of no surprise, portrait doesn't actually have a lot of colors that are outside of the gamut of sRGB. I mean, you can see all the image, all the these little gray points here represent all the colors in that portrait image, and they're you know, nicely falling inside. And, you know, that's actually no surprise because the portrait I just loaded was an sRGB file. But now let's see what happens if I load a pro photo version of that same file. So I'm going to, I'm going to click on and load in the pro photo colors. Now you see what happens here in the pro photo, it has to remap to a different location for the white point. So what we see here is that the, that, that point is, is sort of poking up outside of uh, the sRGB, but basically all the other colors still fall inside of sRGB. There's no shift, really. The only shift that's occurring is because the mathematically the white point's in a different location in 3D space. All of these other colors are pretty easily representable, and there's no difference, in essence, other than the sh mathematical shift in the location of the white point. There's really no difference between the pro photo version of this image and the sRG ver version of the image. There's no extra color. And even the pro photo version fits inside of, of sRGB. You know, so really kind of no worries there. Um, all right, so that's the portrait. Okay, now let's look at another image here. So here's more of a, a kind of a landscape image. It's got uh, some vivid reds. These these flags in the image are, are red, and there's some tans and yellows, and there's some very pale cyans and blues, uh, subtle greens. This this image is more about subtlety, and it's about as saturated as I would care to to make those red flags. Um, so kind of a real world image that has quite a range of colors and tones in it. And let's see uh, what we have when we go into our uh, color mapping. Okay, so let's see. Uh, let's, uh, let's look at the uh, sRGB version of that uh, Venice image. And of course, it fits in nicely inside of sRGB. Uh, I'm going to turn that off and load the pro photo version of this image. So there's the pro photo version of that Venice image and all of the colors fit nicely inside of sRGB. There's no colors coming outside of sRGB. Okay, so being in Profoto does, you know, with this particular image is, it does nothing for me, okay? And I know you're thinking, well, you know, let's look at a more colorful image, right? Let's, let's really see a more colorful image. So, so we will do that. We'll go back and take a look at a more colorful image. So, here we have a real world colorful image. This is uh, these are some flowers in direct sunlight, and uh, let's see how those look. Okay, so again, here's sRGB, and I'm going to load in uh, the flowers. We'll look at the sRGB version, of course, that all fits inside. Now. What you can see actually here is what's happening is that there's certain colors are really getting towards the edge here. They're crowding, crowding the edge of the gamut of that, you know, the very bright yellows, especially it's sort of like starting to line up here right along that edge. So I'm, I would suspect that we might, you know, if we use a bigger version, a bigger color space version of this image, we might have some colors that, that poke out a bit into, into uh, what would be a pro photo. So let's take a look at that. So I'm going to turn off these and look at the same image in Pro Photo. And yeah, just 
you know, they just barely get outside there. And, uh, you know, before you get all excited, you know, these are the, these are certainly natural colors. Uh, but, you know, do we really need Profoto to see those colors? Let's look at Adobe RGB. We'll turn off sRGB. And, in fact, pretty much all except the very brightest yellow colors fall completely inside of Adobe RGB. So we haven't really found an image that really requires Profoto to display all these vivid saturated colors. All right, so let's uh, let's go again. Returning to sRGB, I'm going to turn off my my flower image, and uh, now let's let's find another image. We're, we're looking for an image that really takes advantage of Profoto here. I'm kind of struggling to find it. All right, so um, here's an image, artificially generated colors, and uh, I've, I've wanted to amplify the saturation quite a bit, so I'm really cranking the saturation here in, in Lightroom and Camera Raw to kind of get this to render in, in, with the, vivid, the most vivid colors uh, and still you know, be able to see some detail in the image because I could really crank this beyond usability. But here I think this is adequately colorful and uh, we should be able to see some difference here okay so let's take a look at that go here into uh to my 3d graph display here let's let's load in um well we'll, we'll do the the srgb version first just to be fair i'll load it in here's the srgb version wow it just sort of fills up the whole color space here and you can kind of see it's really crowding the edge there. All those points are you know, really kind of pushing right up against the edge. So I, I know that we're going to have some colors that fall outside of sRGB. So let's see. Um, let's take a look here. Where's our um, pro photo color space? Yes. OK, well, let's, let's look at the pro photo version and just see. just how far those colors go. So I'm going to turn off the sRGB version of this image and use the Profoto version of that that, uh, that image. And you can see, yes, this really pokes out. Those vivid yellows and oranges, there's that you know, really vivid color is way out there. It's well beyond uh, sRGB. Uh, it's reasonably far outside of Here's Adobe RGB, so we're getting we're getting out there a little bit, but really it's only the the most vivid yellow colors, and and uh, you know I'm not really sure that we need those those colors of those lights to be that vivid. Um, it doesn't really matter in the grand scheme of things. I think we can accurately or more or less artistically represent the colors using a not quite so large color space. But just to be fair, here's. Here's the Profoto RGB, and um, you can see how those colors are mapping into this color space. But there's an awful lot of area in Profoto RGB that's not really being utilized, and we have probably the most vivid color image I could come up with. There's some blues here. These are like dipping down into ultraviolet and uh, you know infrared areas in, in this color space. These reds are so far outside of human perception that you know and and look at these greens these these vivid green colors are so far out there uh, this this point you know out at the gamma edges of this color space it's basically not visible to humans so you know the issue here is that we a lot of this color space is wasted on colors that are just not visible just so that we can get a few really bright saturated colors to show up um, and in the end, we can't really view these things. So you're looking at this this whole display uh, in sRGB. Um, let me just show you, compared to the monitor display, here's sRGB. And here's my, uh, let's see, let me find my iMac display is right here. OK, so pretty much very, very similar. It's a little bit bigger than sRGB. I'll make the sRGB one kind of a flat shaded one. So you can see 
the, the iMac display is got, it's a little bit better in the blues and magentas. It's a little bit better in the reds. Uh, not too much better. Uh, certainly in the blue greens and the blues is sort of right right there in sRGB. So it's a little bit larger than sRGB. And um, it's, yeah, we'll make the display flat and we'll show you uh, Adobe RGB a little bit bigger and uh, oddly, you know, the, the iMac has a little bit better blues than uh, what can be seen in uh, in Adobe RGB here. It's kind of interesting. Adobe RGB is the wireframe, better greens, you know, so, um, and this is a decent display, okay, so it's it's got very good uh, uh, color. I've been very happy with it. We can get, you know, some NEC uh, or AZO displays that fill up more of Adobe RGB, but that's about the limit of a visual display. It's just not going to get too much better than that. So, you, you know, no matter what you're doing, trying to decide about ProPhoto RGB, most of the color space of ProPhoto, you're just not going to be able to see to make any kind of intelligent decisions on anyway. Okay, so let's let's return here. So color workspaces um, in Photoshop, to review, our color space choices are from smaller to larger, sRGB, Adobe RGB, and ProPhoto, with ProPhoto significantly larger. About 90% of all real-world photo imagery falls comfortably within sRGB. Most natural colors just aren't that saturated, and, and they can't be, you know, they're not that saturated that they can't be successfully rendered in sRGB. Okay, for the remaining 10% of very saturated reds and greens, Adobe RGB is perfectly adequate. Okay. Another serious consideration is that the rest of the world, from internet display to outside print vendors and graphics device manufacturers, the, the defaults to sRGB. If you work in a collaborative environment, sRGB will make your life a lot easier. Because we cannot view the extra saturated ProPhoto colors in any output device currently available, we cannot effectively use it, and editing in ProPhoto RGB is inherently more difficult because the Photoshop interface only operates at an 8-bit precision. We'll see a little bit more about that later. And we need to be in 16 bits in ProPhoto RGB, just, just because the volume is so big, we need the extra steps. Okay, so really, in this case, uh, bigger is not necessarily better. And now, for an even thornier issue, we finally arrive at probably the most contentious debate regarding workspace choice. Our default Photoshop workspace can be in either 8 bits or 16 bits. The vast majority of Photoshop experts, gurus, professionals, and those that consider themselves serious adamantly maintain that we should always work in 16 bits for the highest quality images. So just what is this anyway? Okay, bit depth refers to the mathematics involved in bitmap image encoding. The bit depth to which an image file is encoded determines the number of discrete levels of tone from black to white that the file can describe. It is these levels of tone in each of the red, green, and blue channels that create the full color image we see. 8-bit files can render 256 levels of tone from 0 to 255, where 0 is black and 255 is white, and there are 254 shades of gray in between. Okay, so 16-bit files can encode 65,536 levels. Wow. Okay, now for various technical reasons in Photoshop, one of those bits is not actually used for image da data. So it's really a 15-bit file with only 32,768 levels, but, but still, it's exponentially greater than an 8-bit file. So with 256 levels of color per channel, if you multiply 256 times 256 times 256 for the three channels rounding off, you get roughly 16.8 million colors. Not bad. Humans can see a few million colors at best, and, and some people it can reach maybe 10 million colors. Uh, so, you know, 16.8 million colors, not too shabby. Now, 16 bits is another story. If we take 
the 15 bits of real data, okay, and multiply out 32,768 times itself three times, okay, for the three channels, we get roughly uh, 35 trillion colors, okay, so that's a lot of color, and one could assume that one would never have too much, right? So just what is the downside to working with 16 bits? So you can imagine just by the numbers, 16-bit files take up twice as much space on disk. They're larger. They require more memory to process in any given graphics application. Photoshop, for instance, requires five times the file size in operating memory to open the file and run its various calculations. So it really adds up. And then when you add in layers, things really start to get heavy. However, in the grand scheme of things nowadays, when your iPhone has more processing power than the computers used to put a man on the moon, well, you know, that in itself is not such a big deal. However, I've often wondered if Adobe was in cahoots with hard drive manufacturers when they introduced 16-bit editing in Photoshop. I don't know about you, but math most, mostly makes my head hurt, and I'm really more interested in uh, in how all this bit stuff impacts image quality. So let's examine this. The numbers suggest that 16-bit files would be better for editing because they have more levels to push around and therefore there would be less chance of banding in the image. Now this is often illustrated by the combing effect in the histogram display of an edited image. 16-bit histograms do not show this effect. So here's a familiar image, and here is the histogram for this image. The histogram basically gives us a simplified display of the statistical distribution of tones in the image. This histogram shows a good range of tones from black on the left to white on the right, with mountain peaks arranged in the left half of the display, indicating that most of the tones are darker than middle gray. Now I'd like to edit the image to make it warmer and brighter. So here is my image after I've applied a curve edit, and here is the histogram after the edit. You can see the series of white vertical lines running through the mountain range. These are gaps where the tones have been spread apart. This is referred to as combing. Now here is the file in 16 bits after the same curve edit with a histogram, and it shows a bit less combing. So technically the edit should be less damaging to the image. Okay, so let's look at this again. Here's the 16-bit version, and here's the 8-bit version. Did you see any change? Let's do that again with a wipe transition from top to bottom. Okay, back to the 16-bit version. Anything noticeable? Uh, let me put a mark here uh, in the background so you can see the wipe across the image. Okay, now going back to the 8-bit version, well, I, I wouldn't expect you to see anything on the video really, but the point here is that we don't see the histogram when we display the image for our audience. So they will never know if any combing occurs. If the image looks better, then it is better, whether the histogram is technically bad or not. Here's the 8-bit histogram again. Now if I wanted a smooth histogram, all I need to do is run a 2% noise filter, and I get a smooth histogram. Did you see the extra noise in the image? Yeah, I, I didn't think so. But this histogram looks good now. A long time ago, in the early days of the transition from film-based photography, I submitted digital files to an ad agency and they rejected them because of bad histograms. Instead of arguing with them, I simply added a little bit of noise to the files and sent them back. And of course, they were accepted and then ran in various ads and no one was the wiser. Here's another interesting demo. Here's the original image, and now I'll posterize it using a posterize adjustment. So what posterize does is to simplify the image into, in this case, four levels per channel. So now, in this image, we have four times four times four, or 64 discrete colors. The image now looks like an illustration because we can clearly see the posterized effect. So here's the starting image again, and this time I'm going to posterize to a level of 40. Can you see the difference? The original had 256 levels per channel for 16.8 million colors. All right, all right, possible colors. There aren't really that many in this image. 
And now it has 40 times 40 times 40, or 64,000 possible colors. And I'm betting that you hardly notice any change whatsoever. Remember, humans are not really capable of seeing more than maybe 10 million colors, so 16.8 million should be plenty for any image. Okay, yeah, so what about the issue of banding? Aren't 16-bit files less prone to banding? Okay, so here's another popular demo with the 16-bit advocates. Here I have a gradient from blue to white, and we might see this kind of gradient in a sky. So let's let's test this. So it's pretty easy to run a curve over this gradient and get discrete bands to show up. Here's the curve I use to push the tones far enough apart to get the bands, which you can clearly see at the right side of the gradient. Now here's the same gradient created in 16-bit with the same curve applied. Clearly a lot smoother, right? It looks like a pretty good proof. Well, I mean, never mind that this kind of curve is not something we would ever apply in a normal image, unless we were looking for an abnormal result. The proof is in the picture. But this is an artificial gradient. And if we need to create an artificial gradient, we can do so such that we don't need to run a curve over it. So what's the point here? Let's, let's look at a real photo image. Here's an 8-bit image that has a nice clear gradient in the sky. Let's see if we can replicate the artificial gradient results. So here's the same 8-bit image with that same radical curve. Look in the sky. If anything was going to show banding, it would be this image. Where's the bands? The fact of the matter is that naturally captured digital photos have enough system-level noise in the file that banding is almost never an issue. And in fact, the only way to have banding problems in a digital photograph is if you run a blur filter over it to simulate depth of field effects. So here's an example or image, the same image, where I ran a Gaussian blur. And now, here's that same radical curve, you know, and at first glance it doesn't appear to be any issue, but if you zoom in and look closer, you'll find bands everywhere as these swirly lines. Now, a 16-bit image will show less of this. So there's the 16-bit image. It's a lot smoother. Now we're kind of struggling here to show some kind of operation where being in 16 bits has an advantage with regards to banding. And remember, this radical curve is not really a real-world example. In fact, to really show how the bands, you know, to really show the bands, we had to zoom in to 400% here. And uh, an additional consideration is that very often when we convert back to 8 bits to make a print, the bands will re-emerge, maybe in slightly different places and maybe a little more subtle, but still there. So here's the original 8-bit file, curved, and uh, we're zoomed into 400%. And, and you cannot see any bands because the natural noise in the file obscures any banding introduced by the radical curve. Now here's the same file after blurring and with a specific kind of noise added to disrupt the bands introduced by the blurring. Now, of course, it doesn't look as smooth as a 16-bit blur, but the point here is that we can easily correct for the bands introduced through radical digital edits with fairly simple techniques. And we know that there is no banding that will show up in a print because we don't have to downsample the 8 bits through the print driver to get our print. Okay, so while editing in 8 bits offers no special real-world advantage, it's still better, right? Well, yes, technically, mathematically, it's still better. This just doesn't save you any time or trouble, and in the end, for just about every type of output or display, you have to end up in 8 bits. All graphics cards driving even expensive top-of-the-line LCD monitors run in 8 bits, so what we have been seeing all along here is a simulation of the differences between 8 and 16 bits. It's kind of like the issue with large gamut color spaces. We can't see the additional 8 bits just like we can't see the additional colors in Profoto RGB. So uh, let's look at Photoshop for one final demo. Okay, so I'm, I'm in Photoshop now and I'm going to make a going to make a new image, new image here, and we'll make it, uh, let's just say, 500 by 500, RGB color, 8 bits, um, all right. So I'm going to fill this 
with 50% gray. Okay, now this, this image is in, is in sRGB. Um, it's in 8 bits too. So uh, let's duplicate this image. So now this copy, I'm going to go to, uh, we'll go ahead and go to 16 bits for this copy. So even though it's just one tone, I, I used it to demonstrate something. And we're going to go to, uh, we're going to convert this to ProPhoto from sRGB. We're going to go to ProPhoto. Uh, clearly, you know, what I have here is 50% gray. It's completely neutral. There's no real color in the image. So basically it's the same in sRGB as ProPhoto RGB. But in ProPhoto now we have many more steps uh, of, of gray in, in three channels than we do uh, in the 8-bit sRGB. So I'm going to make a selection here using the, the square marquee tool. And I'm going to copy this selection to the other channel so it's exactly in the same place. So I'm just going to you know, drag it up here to the other document and drop it right in the middle. Okay, so we have the same selection in both images. All right, I'm going to run a curve. I'm in the 8-bit image right now, 8-bit sRGB. I'm going to do a curve. I'm going to take the red channel and I want to place a point right in the middle. It's inside the selection. So I've got a point in the in the red channel. I'm going to nudge it up with the arrow keys on the keyboard. Okay. There's I nudge it up one. Probably can't see any change. I can just, you know, I can talk myself into seeing where that has gotten a little bit pinker. Let's go. That's two. Uh, you have to kind of do this yourself because on the video, I'm sure you're not going to be able to see it until I get around three or I'm going to go to four. So I have nudged this point up four ticks. Okay, four ticks, and I'm just starting to see a very subtle pink shift. All right, so let's do the same thing here. This We're now in Pro Photo 16-bit, and we're going to do a curve edit, the same curve edit, red channel, I place my point. Now you notice how in in Pro Photo that 50% in the red channel is a little bit lower on the curve, but we're going to put this there anyway. Okay. And now I'm going to nudge it up. Okay, so that's one. Okay, two. Let's that's two ticks up, and now I'm switching to the 8-bit 8-bit um, sRGB. So four, four ticks, four clicks in the, on the keyboard, just four screen points up has made that color, and two has made this color in Pro Photo. So basically, you can see you know, when I make a very subtle move, it has twice as exaggerated an effect. I have a lot more control in sRGB because the steps are closer together. Whether you're an 8-bit or 16-bit, the, the interface is basically only 8-bit precision. So when I move a point up in ProPhoto 16-bit RGB, it doesn't matter. It has a more dramatic effect because the interface can't occupy the same you know, spaces that are available in the 16-bit file. It has to pick in between. And so it's generally like editing an 8-bit. So here's your 8-bit here's your sRGB, four ticks to create this slightly uh, magenta area inside the gray square. And here, two ticks. You know, So I, I, I don't have nearly the amount of fine-tuning control when I'm in ProPhoto 16-bits. So really, a lot of color editing involves subtleties, not dramatic changes, and not very saturated colors. For a very saturated color, you can't, you know, when, when you make a change between one saturated red to another, uh, you oftentimes can't see it. But you can definitely see a very subtle change to a, a neutral color, and that's where it gets tricky. So quite frankly, I'd rather be in 8 bits 
in a less constrained uh, or a or more constrained color space than in 16 bits in a huge color space that is encoding colors that I can't even see. But the important areas, the near neutral colors, I don't have as much control over. All right. So for review, the issue of whether to work in the coarser 256 levels per channel workspace of 8 bits or the finer 32,768 levels per channel comes down to whether you're going to feel better about being in the finest, heaviest version of your chosen workspace. Well, being in 16 bits doesn't offer any significant advantage. There's a fairly low real-world penalty for being in 16 bits. There are a few filters that don't run in 16 bits, and you probably don't need those anyway. Uh, mostly, the benefit to working in 16 bits is fairly esoteric. Some exotic channel blending techniques may benefit from the smoother channel structure of 16 bits. But that's it. Most of the time, for normal image enhancement techniques, there is no observable benefit. The Photoshop interface is 8 bits, so any edits that require fine adjustment moves, like curves, only operate at 8-bit precision. 8-bit files take up 50% less space on the hard drive, so you do the savings math. The smaller memory footprint of 8 bits means slightly faster processing times. Filters and other calculations run faster. So here the choice is a little less black and white than the color space issue because the pros and cons aren't so heavy one way or the other. If it makes you feel better to be in 16 bits because it's technically mathematically better, go for it. If you don't care about math and are the, are the kind of when I see it, I'll believe it kind of person, you'll be happy in 8 bits and you'll save a little bit on hard drive space. So some of you out there just want me to tell you what preferences to be set and be done with it. Okay, fair enough. If you haven't already made up your mind that you must always work in the very largest color space just because, you can set your workspace to sRGB 8 bits and be happy. You can easily make your photos look amazing using these defaults and if your images look good in sRGB, you will have an easier time making them look good in more constrained print output spaces. Thank you for watching. Be sure to visit my blog from time to time as I post free tutorials, and I have a large archive of useful articles on my website at www.ferris.com. Thanks again.